to talk about the NCAA is our friend from the worldwide leader in sports on the Mercedes-Benz Vans phone line. Hello again to Jay Billis. How you doing, Jay? Great, Rich. How are you? Well, I'm not making Tom Brady money, but I'm feeling good <laughs> being a Michigan man. Jay, to be honest with you, well, we're all, we're all we're all striving to make make Rich Eisen money. The Tom Brady uh, money is the next step beyond that. I did not know that. That next step, <laughs> I, I yeah, you could pull you could pull a, a quad making that next step. I'll tell you that, Jay. Got to be limber. Got to be careful about all that. Um, so, uh, w- what did you make of the ruling yesterday by the Division One Board of Directors on how to rein in, if you will, these collectives and 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 what constitutes being a booster? in this NIL world, Jay? You know, it's sort of typical, Rich, of the NCAA. Uh, They want to control every nickel that goes to an athlete. Um, And they were dragged kicking and screaming into this by different states that passed uh, NIL legislation, starting with California and then Florida and others. And then with the ass kicking they took at the United States Supreme Court level, um, that killed, in the Alston case, that killed amateurism. So amateurism is now dead. And what they're trying to do, then they move the goalpost to use a sports analogy to say, well, so now it's not amateurism. Now you just can't be employees and there can't be any inducements um, to get someone to go to a school or to stay at a school. It's got to be for your name, image and likeness that's separate from the, the school. So typical of competition in the free market, these collectives have popped up and there are 501c3 corporations largely. And how most of them work is they'll cut a deal with a player. The coach will go and say, hey, we're going to need $400,000 to get this, this player that we want, whether out of the transfer portal or somewhere else. So they'll deal with the, the, the player, the player's representatives, uh, cut a contract, and the player will have to do charity work uh, spread out over a year or two or appearances or autograph signings or things like that in order to get the money. So it'll be some sort of retention thing. They feel good about, hey, he's doing charity work. He or she is doing charity work, that kind of thing. But really, all it is is the same as a scholarship. It's We're providing this so you'll come here and you'll stay here. And when the NCAA says, well, we don't want pay for play, that's exactly what a scholarship is. It's just capped pay for play. And uh, uh, so the idea that that this is antithetical to what college sports is about and all the coaches and ADs are complaining you know, it, it, when they sign a contract and make millions of dollars, it's just business. But when a player does it, uh, now, you know, everybody's hair is on fire. and We've got, you know, something that's going to shake the very foundation of college sports. And the truth is, it's, it's just business. And this is where it's headed. And before long, uh, because I think the NCAA and the member institutions are going to lose any lawsuit that comes its way about restricting athlete compensation, at some point in the near future, schools will just be signing players to contracts and we'll get on to sort of, sort of the normal business aspect of it. And it'll be be orderly and and it'll do just fine. Well, Jay, I mean, just to hit this a little bit harder, um, you know, it, it seems to me, based on my layperson's uh, view of it, that the board of directors just recast what constitutes a booster and through the collectives into that and saying that you can't have any contact with an athlete, their family members, or um, or anybody prior to them joining the school. And and that's what they did. Uh, did I misread that? Is there, did I miss something here uh, on that? That's what they're saying, but nothing, nothing is going to come of it until they sanction someone whether they sanction the collective or, or you know, with, with uh, they can disassociate people like they did in certain cases in the past with, with what they call boosters. But, you know, it's funny. They don't have a problem with a booster. Nobody said, hey, it's inappropriate for a booster to give a bunch of money to build athletic facilities or it's inappropriate for a booster to give a bunch of money to have a coach fired or hired, which happens all the time. It's only inappropriate when it has to do with an athlete. And what that what that ignores is the, the plain truth that these schools want to pay these players um, it, because it's happening. And any president of a university could put a stop by, to this by saying, we're not going to do this and we're not going to take any player that you're talking to. But they need those players. And, you know, look, I got a text recently from a, an assistant coach at a place where a player just got a, an $800,000 deal, two years, 400000 a year. And said, this guy's making more than I am. And you're saying, well, he's worth more. 
I mean, that's the truth. The player's worth more than the assistant coach. But but we never seem to – we've always said the players aren't worth anything. The NCAA has always said that. The players aren't really worth anything. You know, the, the, the values in the institution and the name on the front of the jersey, not the name on the back. And when it opened up a little bit, um, they found out pretty quickly that that was a lie. Uh, these players have tremendous value in the marketplace. And, and as soon as it, it opens up a little bit – uh, that value is being realized, and it's going to be realized even more. This is not the end of it. It's just the beginning. Jay Billis here on the Rich Eisen Show. I've had, uh, leading up to the NFL draft, uh, Nick Saban and Lane Kiffin and Jimbo Fisher and Mac Brown, just to name four college coaches. By the way, I'm not just name dropping. I'm just pointing out that I had these folks on prior to the draft, asked them all about this subject. Every last one of them said that there's no rules and that uh, it's not fair. Mac Brown even said he had a player come in and said, hey, I've been offered this much at another school. You match and I'm coming here. Um, so don't you th- shouldn't there be some sort of rules around the NIL um, deal or you just think it should be free market? Just go for it, everybody. Jay. Well, absent absent agreement with the players collectively, whether through a trade association or some sort of collective bargaining with the union, uh, what rules can you put in that aren't going to run afoul of federal antitrust law? Like, like, do any of these coaches, you know, ha- feel similarly when an assistant comes in and says, "Hey, look, I got an offer from another another school for more money, and if you can match it, great. If not, I'm going to take this offer." You know, they they call that business. You know, when a player does it, you know, the coaches aren't used to it. They've ruled with an iron fist for all this time, and they've, they've, they've basically had a free ride with regard to players. And they don't have that anymore. But you never saw the, these coaches say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, put the brakes on. We can't build these facilities here at our place because that's going to give us an advantage over some of these other schools. Or I'm not sure we should be flying private when some of these other schools have to bust the games. Uh, and I don't think I should make this much money because other coaches aren't being paid this much, and that's an advantage. Like it, it's ridiculous, and the whole thing's kind of laughable when you when you look at it in a in the the broader business context. I get it. Like if I didn't have to pay my employees, I'd be pretty happy with things. Um, but but sadly, you know, you, you actually have to pay your employees, and and that's the way the world works. And for all the coaches that say now, and look, I love these guys. I mean, I'm friends with them, Mm -hmm. and and we just happen to differ on this this issue. But when they say, this isn't what it's supposed to be about. This is supposed to be about education and mentoring young people and making them into better adults and all that stuff. Okay, if that's what you think it's about, you know, the doors to Division II and Division III are wide open. And coaching in high school, wide open. There's nothing that's stopping anybody from doing that if that's what you think it's really about. But, but, you know, in 90, people say that this is a transformational time, that we've never had this much upheaval, and that's simply not true. In 19, and you and I, Rich, have talked about this. In 1984, all the schools sued the NCAA when the NCAA was telling them how often they could be on television. They couldn't cut their own media rights deals, things like that. And they went to the Supreme Court, and the schools won. And now they could bundle all their TV rights with their conference, they, and Notre Dame could sell them individually. And the money went through the roof, and coaches were paid millions. Strength coaches are paid seven hundred fifty thousand dollars and higher, and and nobody said, "Wait a minute, this isn't what it's supposed to be about." It's a multi-billion-dollar entertainment industry that's run off college campuses, and the idea that we can do this, and and the essential workers, being the players, are gonna are gonna remain unpaid, is laughable. And the Supreme Court laughed the hardest in the Alston case when Justice Kavanaugh, in a concurring opinion, said, in any other business, the way the NCAA restricts athletes would be per se illegal. And they're not going to get away with it anymore. And what the, what that was really saying is, don't bring these lame arguments up here next time because you're going to lose again. And lower courts are going to see that. And they've read it. And, uh, and I don't think the NCAA is going to fare very well in future antitrust cases when they're trying to restrict athlete compensation. Um, it, it, look, the coaches are dealing with the transfer portal now. They've never had to deal with that. And they're dealing with the players that are making decisions now with money as a factor. It's not the only factor, but money's now a factor, and it was never a factor before. And they've not had to deal with that. Well, guess what? You've got to deal with it now. And, uh, and that's, uh, that, that's just the way it is. And they can complain about it. I get the complaints, but pretty soon they're going to stop complaining and they're going to start figuring out how to deal with it. 
because this isn't going anywhere. So then what's the impediment, Jay Billis? I mean, you're, you're describing a totally broken dam and and the D1 board of directors with a sandbag out there as, <laughs> as the dam has totally broken. Um, I mean, the president of the University of Georgia is the chair of the board, and I'm sure they've got enough lawyers to tell them what time it is in the same way that, that you are. Um, what's the impediment here? Uh, Mark Emmert's leaving. Um, what do you think? Jay, well, like, impediment to impediment to what? Like, to, to, like, to, to, to implementing what you're talking about. Just saying, just figure, like realize what time it is and come up with a system and a unionization process um, and contracts and some sort of uniformity that that makes this somewhat of a level playing field for some people as opposed to, uh, you know, catch as catch can. Like, what, what, do well, you, what do you think? Well, there are a couple things. Well, first of all, the reason they're not doing it is they don't want to because they, they know that the players are worth more than they are. And so uh, you know, asset allocation and money toward, toward um, you know, procuring talent is going to be funneled differently than it is now. Right now it's funneled to coaches and administrators and for facilities and all these other things. And they know that model is going to change, and talent procurement is going to is going to take even more money, and it's going to take money away from other things. And the NCAA structure, they look at that as their money, like that's our money. You know, it, 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 they don't look at it as, as as the athletes' money. Where it should be rich, and where I think it's ultimately headed in this, but when everybody wraps their head around it, is is just simply signing players to contracts. It's ludicrous to believe that these institutions and the coaches and all that, they know exactly whom to recruit and exactly whom to put in the game when they want to win. But they don't know how much the players are worth to them. They know exactly what they're worth. And, and you know, they, they, they make decisions on what to pay employees every day at these schools. And they have, they have tens of thousands of employees at each one of these institutions. And they're not sitting up at night going, what do we do? What do we pay the president versus the head of food service? Because both of them work really hard. In fact, the food service head works harder than the president. Uh, and, you know, sweating over those those hot pan, pots and pans. And that's unfair. And, you know, if, if the NCAA was really worried about a level playing field, we don't have one now, by the way. If they were really worried about that, there'd be spending caps on facilities and there'd be revenue sharing. And there's none of that. All of these institutions are market competitors against one another. They're market competitors for talent, whether players or coaches or administrators. They're market competitors for media rights dollars, and they're certainly market competitors you know, when they play against one another. They're all trying to win the most, make the most money, and, and advance their institutions through the use of athletics. They're all trying to do that. And so, you know, how is it that that we could say, well, it needs to be fair with regard to athletes only. That's the only area of this business we're going to have a spending control. Everything else, free market, do whatever you want. Um, it, it's it's an absurd notion. And, you know, the Supreme Court finally said so. It took, you know, it took the legal system a while to catch up to, to the fiction that the NCAA has put out all these years. But now they're having to deal with it. And, uh, and look, do I think that, that this thing by the board of directors is going to work? No. You're not going to stop the flow of money in this. It's not going to happen. And people can say, hey, you know, we shouldn't be building these facilities. We shouldn't be flying private. We shouldn't be playing 9 o'clock games in the middle of the week. Every game shouldn't be on television. They can all say that, but they're all doing it. And, and I used to laugh when, when administrators or coaches would say to me, how can these games be on at 9 o'clock? And I would say, look, respectfully, like we, we don't tell you when to play your games. You can play all of them at noon on Saturday if you want to. All we said to you was we'll, we'll pay more for 9 o'clock on Tuesday than we will for 1 o'clock on Saturday. And you said, okay, we'll play on Tuesday. That sounds great. You know, we didn't force them. Media rights company or media companies don't force these schools to play at certain times. They offer more money to play then, and, and they agree to it. You know, we don't force the coaches to do halftime interviews. It's in the contract. We pay them money to do that, and they said yes. And then they want to complain, well, I don't want to do an interview at halftime. Well, it, we don't care whether you want to do it or not. You agreed to it, and we paid you for it. You know, that, that's, sort of, that's sort of the way this stuff works, and, and somehow college sports acts like um, everybody's impinging upon, upon their rights here, and nobody is. And, and again, like, if, if any of these schools, if Ohio State decides this is not for us, 
they can play in Division Two or Division Three, and we can have the Buckeyes versus Amherst at the shoe for free admission and no TV, and and see how Buckeye fans like that. I, I don't think they'll like it, and I don't think they'll stand for it. But everybody can talk all they want to, but their actions show that they want to participate in this multi-billion-dollar entertainment industry, run off their college campus. But but they just don't want to pay their employees, being the players, and that's just not going to work. Well, I guess we've reached the end of the interview and the point where I always ask you if you want the job. This is the first time the job is actually up there. Mark Emmert's leaving. Would you take it over, Jay? I mean, and implement everything here? I know maybe something would have to freeze over that's very warm, but what do you think? Would you do it? You want it? So you're, a, you're, asking a, you're asking a person, would you like to take the helm of a ship that the last captain ran aground? Um, you, you know, the answer would probably be for most sane people, no. But, um, look, I, I've always said, and I've said this to you, like I, I've always wanted to help. So if I could help in any way, they'll never ask me, so I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> because, because, you know, it, it's, a, uh, it, it's a job that requires um, – it, it's a job that requires being honest about the business. And the business is a multibillion-dollar entertainment industry. And each school is responsible for educating their students. The NCAA office has never educated a single student. That's not what they do. Just like, just like they've never, you know, they can talk about health and safety and, and, uh, and medical well-being and all that. They have never operated on or, or rehabbed a single athlete. That's not what they do. The schools do that. Uh, so that's up to each individual institution. What they really do is they run a really good basketball tournament, and they do it really well. Outside of that, the NCAA doesn't do a whole lot of things well. What, what they really do is muck up a lot of things and screw up a lot of things. But, but they've had a free ride with regard to athletes for over 100 years now, and the free ride is over. And, uh, and, you know, look, nobody turned their TV off last year with NIL and the transfer portal. Not one TV got shut off. And, and that what we were told that as soon as athletes get more than the scholarship, it's over. You know, nobody's going to watch anymore. The product's going to diminish. And the Big Ten is about to sign a, a, a contract for their media rights that will be worth over a billion dollars a year and pay each institution in that league $70, $80 million a year, whatever it is. Um, so, you know, the idea that people think that this is not going to continue to increase in value and can continue to do well because live sports is, if not the most valuable thing in media, it's one of the most valuable things. And it's not going anywhere. It's only going to get bigger and better. Jay, you're the man. Look for my call again. You be well. Hit him straight in the meantime if you get a chance. Thanks for the call. All right, brother. I'll see you in July when I get out to L.A. Always. You know you've always got a spot here. Thanks, Jay. You take care. See we'll chalk before the draft, too. That's Jay Billis at Jay Billis. Hey, you watched all the way to the end. Thanks for that. Watch more right here.